This video is about Turbo DSM throttle buddies. It's long overdue. I should have done this a long time ago because I have every single one of them from 1989 to 1999. It's what I do. I want to start with the 90 model first, but it happens to be installed on my 1992 Elantra right now. If you found for whatever reason that you need to rebuild yours, then not only is this video for you, but you're also going to have to take it off the car first. There's a lot of stuff in its way. The average car is pretty crowded. I may have made my battery easy to remove, and of course the couplers are a piece of cake, but it ends there. You just need enough room to get the elbow off and to remove the fast idle air valve hoses. That's pretty much it. Make sure to unplug the throttle position sensor and the idle speed controller motor, and to mark and disconnect vacuum lines if you have them. Next, remove the four nuts and bolts that hold the elbow on. The throttle body and all the sensors will slide off as an assembly. On every car equipped with a fast idle air valve, there are coolant lines that run to it. Coolant doesn't evaporate, and it loves to short out electrical circuits. Ask me how I know. You'll need to drain the coolant level lower than the throttle body hoses anyway, so about a gallon works. Different year cars will present different challenges for this, and my Elantra doesn't apply to any of them, so let's get to the meat already. I'm more interested in talking about the throttle bodies and what it takes to put them back into good health than I am with installing and removing them. We're going to use OEM parts where available. I say that because some of them aren't. I'm going to give you the information for how to source the ones you can't get anymore, and we're even going to fabricate a few of our own parts that might get you out of a pinch. Maybe these parts availability changes after this video. I can't predict the future, but for right now, some of the factory parts and supplies for some of these throttle bodies have either dried up or become unobtainably expensive now. That's all three of them right there. The one in my left hand with three vacuum ports and no idle speed controller motor on it is from a second generation turbo car. A 95 if you want me to be specific. We'll just set that one aside and save that one for last. Now, the one in my left hand is the 1991 94 throttle body, and it still has all of its giblets and entrails attached to it from when I pulled it off of an early 92 GSX. You'll also notice the 91 94 throttle body has four vacuum ports, three straight and one angled. If this is your throttle body, you're lucky. You can still get all the parts for these. There's no benefit between the 91 94 and the 1990 throttle body that's in my right hand because neither one is bigger than the other. Both bores are exactly the same size and they do all the same things but with different sensors and coolant valves. The linkage and the throttle switch are the same but the throttle position sensors are different, rare, and expensive for the 1990 model. The 90 versus the 91 to 94 throttle position sensors are wired differently as well on the engine harness. The parts for the 90 are hard to source and it's the first one in the DSM lineup so that's the one we're going to start with. It's the biggest problem child. Whenever you read forum posts about about doing this. Everyone talks about using an impact driver. I'm here to tell you that you don't have to use one for this. That's why. And it, not all impact drivers are created equal. The one like this one that they sell at your local auto parts store has bits that seem to fit this screw, but it's the wrong tool for this job. And the bits that come with this tool are too big and cut at angles that are made for doing brake jobs, not throttle plate screws. Once you've attempted to use this kind of an impact driver, it blows the slot right open and it will never be satisfied by any other screwdriver. And if you strip them, you have to replace them. Don't use a big brake job impact driver on a throttle body. Use a small impact driver that fits standard screwdriver bits if you're going to use an impact driver at all. This one came from Harbor Freight years ago, and I think they're out of production. They have a different six-piece set now you're more likely to find the right Phillips head bit to fit the screws with the one that uses the smaller bits. I have to do some massaging and finesse work to try to get something to bite now. Sometimes you can hammer a bit into the screw and create something new to bite onto, so I'm going to start there. Banging on the throttle shaft is really something you want to avoid whenever you can. But in this kind of a situation, you sometimes have to make some concessions. As you can see how the bit bites now, it put a Phillips head shaped slot back into a stripped screw. So if you're smart and you don't grab an impact driver first, you grab a torch and a good penetrating oil. Heating these parts up will use thermal expansion to your benefit and disrupt the fit of the screw inside the threads. Penetrating oil chases heat, so heat makes it work even better. The penetrating oil that I'm using is my favorite. I'm not going to sell you on this stuff because it's not my job. But after I quench the parts, I heat them back up again, and let's give the plain old screwdriver a shot. Okay, well the first screw stripped pretty bad, so let's see if the other one bites.
The screw broke loose with heat, penetrating oil, and a regular old screwdriver. That's a pretty sharp contrast to all those claims that this requires an impact driver. But the people who recommend it still aren't wrong. It's just the most destructive means of doing this. Now that I've got a stripped screw left, it's still a helpful tool. I tried one more time to drive the bit in and break the screw loose, and it did break, but there's not enough of a head left on the screw after that for me to be able to back it out of the hole. Since the screw broke free, you can grab the edges of it with pliers and turn it, and that's working for me here, but it's gonna take all day. But if you're not lucky enough to be able to do this, you're going to need a tiny cutoff wheel to grind a big flathead slot into the head of the screw, and that's the moment when your luck is gonna to start to change. It doesn't matter which way the screw is positioned, just put a big slot all the way across the head. The screw is already ruined, so as long as you're careful enough not to slip and gouge the throttle body with the Dremel, then there's really nothing to lose here by doing this. Try to match the profile of your biggest flathead screwdriver. The big driver will apply more force on the outer edges of the screw head, and it'll be less likely to strip out the screw any further. And there you go, it's working for me. Before you try to remove the throttle plate, make a note of which side of the throttle shaft the screw heads are on with the plate closed, and then mark it with something sharp. I like to scratch my mark into the throttle plate because you're going to use cleaning agents that remove paint and magic markers and all the gunk that gets on the throttle body, and then you have no marks to reference. The scratches will still be there afterwards. My throttle plate is binding, and that's probably because of all the banging I did on it with the impact driver and the screwdriver bits. It's only binding on one side, though. With a little massaging, I was able to get it to move slightly. But because I can't get a good enough grip on it, I grabbed a hooked pick, poked it through the screw hole, and found the grip I needed. That's the most crucial step of the job. You can't remove the shaft or change the throttle body shaft seals if you don't take the throttle plate out first. Once you got it out, inspect the edges to make sure you didn't cause any damage. Clean it with solvents and a rag only. Don't use abrasive tools or use any kind of a sharp thing on the edge of it. All first generation throttle bodies should have a throttle stopper switch, whether or not you use it. Without it, the throttle will stick. All DSM throttle bodies are double sprung. It's a good idea to mark a straight line across the spring so you know when you have them wound tight enough. But if you don't, I'll tell you how to fix this later. Before I take the linkage side apart, I'm gonna remove the throttle position sensor. Do that first. The 1990 throttle position sensor doesn't fit anything but a 1990 throttle body. And you can't use it on later production throttle bodies. And you can't use a later production throttle position sensor on the 1990 throttle body. The way the shaft interfaces with the sensor is completely incompatible, never mind the fact that the electrical connections and the screw holes are completely different. Now that the throttle position sensor is off, there's only one nut left to remove the linkage assembly, and we can extract the throttle shaft and the seals. It's supposed to just slide off, but the spring pressure and age can really help them stick together. Don't just pry on it to remove it. Try to wiggle it, switching to opposite sides, and walk it off the slotted threaded end of the throttle shaft. Once you pop it off the metal outer plate, the springs will unload and you can remove the rest of the assembly. There's a plastic spacer on the throttle position sensor side. Don't lose track of that thing, trust me. Watch my previous shootout prep video if you want to see the holy suffering that occurs when you forget that part. That video even shows you how to figure out if you need to rebuild your throttle body in the first place. Look, these videos are just documentaries, and this is the first time in all my years of DSMing that I've seen the guts of a 90 throttle body. I've rebuilt every other kind of turbo DSM throttle body but this one. And this is the moment when you catch a Jaffro in its natural habitat completely ignorant of what he's doing, oblivious to the vast online resources that would make him look like less of an idiot. Watch the Jaffro as he manages to pop an E-clip out of a groove that's recessed down into a bore that's the same diameter as the E-clip. Neat party trick, bro. Now for my next trick, find the E-clip. Look, just because you can doesn't mean you should. This is actually so much easier than what you just saw me do. It still got me to my goal of removing the throttle shaft, but don't ever do it this way. Now that I've seen what's going on inside here, I can see a better way to do this that requires a fraction of these efforts. As you peel back the onion, there's a stack of washers and seals inside this thing of different materials and that are arranged in a specific order. Under the E-clip, there's a plastic washer, a metal washer slash spacer, and the original factory mil-spec seal. When I bought the parts to rebuild this thing, I was expecting it to have the same seals inside it, and boy was I wrong. There's two seals, and they're different. One's smaller than the other one. 
Looking closer at the bore, you can see the small seal is recessed deeply below the rim of the throttle position sensor. You can see the broken down, dry rotted rubber junk from the seal in the bore. It's just evidence that the seals were done and not doing much of anything to keep the boost in. It's because of this discovery that I realize I don't have all the right seals, and so I take my frustration out on doing a little bit of cleaning. My preferred weapon of choice for machined gasket surfaces is always a razor blade. 30 year old gasket adhesive and paper fibers pressed into the metal between a massive clamping force means that this part of the job can take you a little while, and you should spend as long as it takes to get it down to bare metal. I prefer doing this by hand over using power tools because you get to be more careful and the throttle body is the worst place that you can leak boost from. So clean all the gasket material and funk off of every single flanged or sealed surface and be careful not to use tools or methods that will cut, scratch, or damage any of those surfaces and cause a leak. The face of the throttle body is rough and a wire brush works well here, but there may be a ring around the face when you're done because it's not machined flat. Clean the bore with solvents and a rag only as best you can. Don't use anything sharp or abrasive for this. You don't have to use Q-tips or anything for the throttle shaft bore. You can just poke a rag through it with a punch and floss out all the crud. One thing worth noting about the throttle shaft is how the factory peening these screws affects the shape of the screw holes. That crushing process widens the screw holes from the inside, sometimes leaving a sharp burr on the shaft that can gouge the throttle body shaft bore when you install and remove it. With all that polished off of it, you're less likely to damage the inside of the bore or to cut grooves into your brand new seals during the assembly stage. However, before we talk about that assembly stage, let's complete the disassembly first, shall we? You can see how the seal on the throttle linkage side is located all the way on the outer edge of the bore here. If you use a screwdriver or a seal puller, make sure to just hook the inside lip of the seal to pry it out. Don't go digging deep. It's okay to gently scrape crusty things out of the bore, but again, you just want to use the rag poke floss method with a little solvent to clean these bores up. So here's the box of parts I ordered, thinking that this would be just like all the other throttle bodies I've rebuilt. Let's see if they sent me the correct seals from my throttle body by mistake. Nope, they sent me just what I ordered. All right, so now I'm gonna walk away and feel depressed for a little while. Snap out of it, Jaffro. Cleaning things is always a cure for negative energy. So I took it out on the throttle body systems with a wire cone brush on the Dremel. This makes quick work of breaking up the carbon and funk deep inside the cast passages, and the gooey stuff washes out pretty easily with some carb cleaner and compressed air. The 90 throttle body has its own gasket. It's got a weird diagonal cut on the bottom that accommodates the 90 throttle body's fast idle air valve porthole. The front edge of the OE gasket that mates with the throttle body has a sealing adhesive applied to it, and the part that goes up against the intake manifold doesn't. It's pretty hard to put this gasket on wrong. Now that I've got air, I'm going to wash this thing out one last time, brush out and wipe out the throttle shaft bore again, and test fit all my parts that I've removed so far. This is an important step. If you don't test fit all these bits first, it's possible that you hit a snag once you're in assembly mode, and the more you fumble with it, the more likely you are to damage the new seals, so test fit everything first. For instance, I noticed that I created a burr on the edge of my throttle plate when I extracted it. It made it particularly difficult to reinstall the throttle plate. You know I said not to use abrasive tools on the outer edge, and I'm following that rule here. I'm using a small flat file and filing parallel to the face of the plate to remove the burr. I'm not filing the edge. Doing it this way is okay. The idle speed control motor on a 90 is all cast aluminum. It's held on with two screws that only like to break loose with an impact driver. And again, the compact version works the best for accessing these screws. I'm not clamping down the throttle body, so I'm kind of chasing it around on the workbench. But once you've got these two screws off, you can lightly tap and separate the ISC from the throttle body. Underneath it, you find machine surfaces on both sides that fit tightly together, and protruding from the ISC is a plunger that moves in and out in a hole to regulate idle. It's an electronic valve. That's all it is. There's an O-ring sandwiched in here. This is your seal. Over time, the O-ring gets hard or compresses and changes shape, and this can lead to vacuum or boost leaks. I'm going to give this the same treatment that the other cast portions of the throttle body received to get the funk out. Cone brush on a Dremel, some carb cleaner, rags, and compressed air. A few minutes is all it takes to remove 30 years worth of buildup. You might notice I didn't touch the O-ring seal boss with these tools. That's because they're machined surfaces. Only use rags and solvents to clean up the O-ring seal bosses. 
The ISC gets caked with funk too. Rather than drowning an electrical part with plastic bits inside it with carb cleaner, I'll just douse it a rag with carb cleaner and wipe off the carbon that I can get to externally. So with all of the idle speed control parts cleaned, it's time to replace the seals and put it all back together. All the part numbers for the stuff I use in this video are in the description, but this ISC O-ring is just a standard number 28 O-ring. Mitsubishi used this O-ring on practically every car, truck, and forklift they made from 1988 to 2000, so it's never going away. That's a good thing, but what stinks is that one of the shaft seals for this 1990 throttle body is completely sold out and unobtainable now. That was what I discovered when I walked out of the shop to go be depressed. It's not the only part that I can't get from Mitsubishi either. I thought I was going to have to find an old Mitsubishi in a junkyard, cut off its throttle position sensor harness, rewire my car to accept the 91 and up TPS, change out the 90 fuel rail so the 91 TPS will fit, and probably damage an injector o-ring in the process. But never fear, there are still two other ways that you can do this. In a pinch, if you didn't destroy the seal prying it out with a screwdriver, you can burn off all the rubber and source an o-ring that fits between the metal housing of the old seal and the throttle shaft. Yes, it's possible to make your own seal. The quickest way to do this is to burn off the rubber and scrape it out. You can still scrape it all off without using fire, it just takes forever to do it that way. On this one, it's not burnt yet. You can see how brittle the seals become, and it was cracked all the way through in several places. It's like plastic almost. This rubber doesn't last forever. Ultimately, fire works better to remove it, though. I think I proved my point. I went out and bought over $100 worth of O-rings to find the size I need to do this. I did this so that you don't have to. I bought metric and standard sizes. I was actually surprised that I couldn't get any of the common metric sizes to work for this. That sucked for me because they cost the most. What ended up working was a pair of standard O-ring kits. The little one came from a Pep Boys rack and the big one came from Harbor Freight. I found that the small end of the shaft likes the 5 16th inch inner diameter by 7 16th inch outer diameter by 1 16th of an inch wide O-ring. That's the one right there. The O-ring looks loose inside the ceiling ring and that's intentional. When you install the shaft, the O-ring stretches and gets pressed against the inside of it, completely filling that void. But the O-ring isn't going to stay put in one spot. The O-ring is going to turn against both the seal and the shaft. So you need to grease it really well. Even if you do, over time, the edges of the ceiling ring will wear it down and start to shred it. I got a couple of years out of doing this once before, but it doesn't really last forever. It's, it's, it goes bad. It does. For the big O-ring, the same thing applies. The standard O-ring kit from Harbor Freight did the trick. It's another 16th inch thick O-ring. It has a 3 8 inch inner diameter and a half inch outer diameter. If you don't get the O-ring thickness just right for your seals, it puts too much drag on the throttle plate shaft, and that could result in hanging the throttle plate open. That could create a horrible outcome, so you want to be sure nothing's dragging on the throttle shaft and that you can turn it easily with two fingers when you're done. So again, the sizes are 3 8 inch by 1 half inch by 1 16th of an inch for the big seal, as well as both of the shaft seals for all 1991 to 99 throttle bodies. They use the same seal. And 5 16th by 7 16th by 1 16th thick for the small seal. These are the O-rings that will get you out of a pinch. They're the best combination of sealing and fitting properly so that you don't create a hazard. I'm also not the only person who's ever done this. I take no credit for this hack. If you don't like the idea of doing the fix I just performed because it's only a temporary solution, then you can still source a comparable replacement from industrial suppliers. These seals are used in robotics and food preparation. It's not going to be as easy as searching a Mitsubishi part number, that's for sure. You're probably not going to be able to just buy one either. It's a G8 by 12 by 3B, or G8X12X3B. I paid an astronomical shipping rate for two of these things because I'd rather do this job right once and not have to keep coming back here every couple of years to fix the same thing. It's quite a bit of work to get this deep into a throttle body after all. At least it is if you didn't know that this is all you have to do to get the throttle shaft out. I'm grateful that these seals arrived the day before I needed to have a running Hyundai on a trailer going to Ohio. The part on the 90 throttle body that's unique to all other models is the dang E-clip. When I removed this thing, I wasn't gentle and I must have damaged the E-clip because when I test fit it back onto the shaft, it cracked in half and fell apart. It's not supposed to do that. So what happens if you break this thing? Can you find another one? 
I couldn't when I was under a time crunch to get this car back on the road, that's a fact, so I searched high and low looking for an Eclipse that I could get fast to match these specs. Couldn't find one anywhere, until I went to Fastenal and discovered that they had nothing in the bins that matched it either, but they did have this $90 assortment that had the right outer diameter, and almost the right inner diameter. I probably got really gouged on this. But I didn't have a choice. It had two Eclipse that would have worked in it. The quarter inch and the 5 16th inch. Strangely enough, the 5 16th inch E-clip was actually smaller in outer diameter than the quarter inch is. It was also a lot less substantial of an E-clip. So I went with the quarter inch for rigidity's sake and because it filled up the bore in the throttle body a little bit better. Only problem is that the inside diameter of the quarter inch E-clip I selected is actually 221 thousandths of an inch, not 250, which is four millimeters or a quarter inch like the groove in the shaft, and that caused it to flare out and not fit the inside of the bore where it belongs. So rather than use the better fitting, flimsier looking, smaller outer diameter 5 16th inch E-clip, I filed down the tabs on the quarter inch so that it wouldn't flare and would fit the throttle shaft correctly. This is how I sourced this part to get my car to the shootout in time. Another thing I found at Fastenal is the throttle plate screws. Tapered M4s with a .7 thread pitch, 10 millimeters long. Never mind that they're galvanized steel. Lots of people have trouble finding these things at this length with a tapered head, and so did I. They're more commonly found starting around 12 millimeters long, but there's all the info right there for the screws that are exactly the right size and shape, so you should have no trouble finding them. Of course, you must use Loctite at the very least to help these screws stay put. I would not solely rely on a thread locker though. Losing one of these in a running engine will typically be the end of that engine, so using a thread locker by itself is really inadequate. Because the throttle shaft is 10 millimeters and has tapered bores, a portion of the screw will protrude from the opposite side. This is intentional. The best way to ensure a screw stays put is to peen them like the factory did, and you need to have a little hanging out to do that. I don't have the neat expensive push button hydraulic press that Mitsubishi used. I found that my 27 millimeter socket lined up perfectly across both of the throttle plate screws to make an excellent anvil. I like to use a sharp punch to stake the end. Did you say stake? Yes, and it's complete overkill here. Peening simply means to smack it with a hammer to compress the surface of the thing. I just used a punch to help my aim. Staking pretty much destroys the part, but those screws aren't going anywhere now. You're probably wondering why I'm installing the throttle plate without showing the shaft seal installation. I guess I got carried away showing you the screws. Really, when I got back from the shootout and imported the footage of this that I had shot, I realized that it was unusable, and the throttle body was actually rebuilt and bolted back onto the car already. The camera was zoomed in too close, and I moved what I was working on out of the shot. You can see some of that going on here, and it only gets worse because I was in a terrible hurry. I did a great job on the throttle body rebuild, but the quality of the second half of the video was so bad that I knew I'd have to reshoot it. I did not feel like taking my perfectly good rebuilt throttle body apart to reshoot a handful of scenes and breaking loose all the seals on my new non-leaky gaskets. Not after what this one put me through before the shootout. Luckily for me, the DSM community is my family, and Jason Drew, my Canadian brother in DSMs whose car's gone a whole lot faster than everything I've ever built, sourced a 1990 throttle body for me and saved all of my efforts on this video. Thank you, Jason. Oh wow, I wasn't expecting this. That was nice of you. Go on over to Jason Drew's DSM channel and subscribe. He's about to do a second generation front wheel drive to all wheel drive conversion again, for the second time now at least. Thanks for all your help with saving this video, Jason. This is amazing. Every sensor, every clip, bracket, wire tie, and harness still bundled together the way it came from the factory. Looks like the engine had a bad PCV problem or lost a turbo shaft seal or something. It's really caked. Let's test out all the advice I just offered and catch back up to where we were. Use carb cleaner, rags, compressed air, and if it's really soiled, use a nylon brush. Fire is your friend. Always initiate freshly acquired parts and fire. If the screwdriver feels like it's about to strip the screw, just give it some more heat. That outcome was very different, wasn't it? So don't believe everything you read. Try to save your biggest hammer for last. It can add days back onto your life. 
You didn't see me bang on this thing even once, but it's putting up a fight just like the last one with the throttle plate. It helps to take the spring pressure off the shaft first, though, because you get tired of holding it open. Might as well remove the TPS sensor, too, while I'm at it. It turns out this round thing is just a dust seal, and it's there to prevent your TPS from malfunctioning in the event that there's a whole lot of blow-by from a bad throttle shaft seal. It's also made of rubber, not plastic. This one's surprisingly squishy for its age. There's your close-up of the factory shiny steel E-clip that it's supposed to have, smooth side down and recessed into the bore. And let's take the throttle linkage assembly off, shall we? I bought this 12 years ago, and it's a well-named product. I mentioned that you can mark your springs to help you get the tension right. Well, you can. And if it's your first time rebuilding a throttle body, you should. Might as well pair that with the task of marking the throttle plate orientation. Again with the throttle plate. I don't ever remember having this kind of difficulty on any other throttle body that I've rebuilt. If you have to fight your throttle plate to get it out, however you do it, keep the plate's position perfectly vertical and be extra careful not to gouge the bore while extracting it. Doing it with the hook didn't leave a mark on it. And wouldn't you know it, it came with the exact same factory burr that needs to be filed off. It's also got a flat edge on one side. Throttle plates aren't perfectly round, just be, be aware of that. Moving on, remember that E-clip? This is all you have to do to extract it. Stop looking at the size of my hammer. Grind off the burrs on the shaft before you pull it out for best results. And that's how this whole thing comes out. Assembled. Now you can easily pull the E-clip on your workbench instead of in a bench vise. You can grab the E-clip with a pair of needle nose pliers to pull it off, but I just popped it off with a hooked pick because it was already laying on the workbench in front of me. A few seconds later, and the washer and seal came right out with it. We'll just glaze over the rest of this cleaning part. You know how I did it already. I didn't change anything about it, at least not until I got to the ISC motor. I found a lot of corrosion between the flanges, as if this thing lived near salt water. It did come from Canada, so maybe from salted roads. Either way, minute effort with the Dremel removed all of it. I just want to be sure it would clamp all the way back down on the flange to squish its new seal as much as possible to help the boost stay in. I don't know why, but I found it amusing that the O-ring grew while clamped tightly in that groove. But I thought I'd show you that. It's just another way an O-ring can fail. I finished up the cleaning until I was happy with it, took off all the vacuum lines, straightened out the vacuum port that was bent, and then removed the electrical harness from this thing. That about covers the disassembly and all the stuff that I missed. We're almost ready for assembly, but let's take some measurements first, shall we? We all know that it's a 10 millimeter shaft. Looks like the throttle linkage was turned down to 9 millimeters. The throttle position side was turned down to 8 millimeters. See? Shaft's 10 millimeters. I noticed the other shot of the screws was blurry, so here you can see how the fire method worked to prevent these screws from getting munged. Here's the 90 throttle plate, and you'll see that it's stamped with a 50. It measures 2.5 millimeters thick. Across the flat edge on it, it measures 59.69 millimeters, and across the fat edge, it measures 60 millimeters. There's the outer diameter of the small seal, 12 millimeters. The inner diameter is supposed to be 8 millimeters, but we won't get that here. The shaft it seals against is 8 millimeters. There's the $100 E-clip if you've been following its story. You can see it's 0.8 millimeters, or 35 thousandths of an inch thick. Its outer diameter, and this is the crucial part, is 12.76 millimeters, or a half an inch. Its inner diameter is actually a quarter inch. So the seals are metric, the O-rings are standard, the throttle shaft and screws are metric, and the E-clip is also standard. Makes sense, right? The spacer washer used in the assembly is 1.15 millimeters, or 5 hundredths of an inch thick. The plastic washer is a half a millimeter, or two hundredths of an inch thick. The diameters and thicknesses of these parts and their arrangements were all carefully planned by the engineers because the bore they live in is drilled, countersunk, and sleeved. While it's strange compared to their other designs, it's actually really cool, and it gives an inside look at how creative the engineers really were. Before you start assembly, make sure there's no scratches, burrs, or deformities on the first and second edges of the countersunk bores. You can't have anything on either one that you can feel with your finger. If you find anything out of the ordinary with your finger, you have to fix it first. It doesn't matter which ear throttle body you have or which size seal, you gotta do this inspection. You won't find the original mil-spec seals for these things anywhere. The only ones left are the rubber ones now, and they're perfectly fine if not better than the mil-spec seals especially from an installation standpoint. There's a beveled edge and a grooved edge. The groove goes towards the throttle plate. The beveled edge faces out. 
You'll never be able to do this with a mil-spec seal, but I like to install the big seals dry, gradually, and by hand. You have to do this with the seal perfectly centered, start with light pressure, and just slowly massage it in there. There are seal installer tools available within the community if you search around, and if I could have found it, I'd be using it right now and linking it in the description too. If one side slips in too deep, pull it out and start over. If there's a burr or a sharp edge on the outer lip of the seal boss, you will destroy the seal doing this. It has to go in perfectly level with the bore. I like to put the seal in dry because I want it to stick and stay in there under boost. But then right after that, I want to apply a big glob of dielectric grease to the inside of the bore and smear it evenly around the length of it, from the lip of the seal to where the throttle bore starts. Next, take the throttle shaft with the TPS end facing out and shove it through the throttle linkage side of the throttle body. This will grease the entire length of the bore. It also leaves a little excess on the edge of the shaft where it's turned down smaller. Leave the groove on the throttle shaft protruding on the TPS side so that you can stack and assemble the seal, washer, and E-clip. Of course, the seal goes on first. You can see the grease built up behind it. It's your friend here. You want this. Add some if it didn't happen to you. Next, install the metal washer against the flat edge of the rubber seal. Then comes the nylon washer, which is intended to prevent metal-on-metal -metal contact between the washer and the E-clip. And then snap the E-clip on, ensuring that all three edges are seated properly in the groove. You should be able to rotate the E-clip once it is. All you have to do to install the seal is pull on the throttle linkage side while turning it, and then press on the TPS side while turning and pulling on the throttle linkage side. The throttle shaft keeps the new seal centered while the washer stack in its specific thicknesses press all the parts into the bores. The parts themselves are the seal driver. Once you've got it installed deep enough that the E-clip is below the flat outer surface of the bore, get a small hammer and tap it home until you hear it seat. The engineers planned it this way. It works really well, but it's overly complicated with too many parts. It's probably why they later ditched this design. I cleaned off the burr from the throttle plate that was in exactly the same spot as the other one that I blamed myself for earlier, followed my marks, and put the throttle plate back in. I used red Loctite on the factory original screws that I didn't damage, and I honked the screws as tight as I could by hand without stripping them. Next I made sure to install the blow-by seal for the throttle position sensor because I'm not forgetting that thing again. I don't know the condition of the base idle set screw o-ring, but I'm replacing it anyway. After you back the bisque screw all the way out, just grab it with a magnet because it's recessed down in a hole. Clean up the bisque screw threads and the tip with carb cleaner and a rag and pick the o-ring off of it. There's the part number for the bisque screw o-ring. Just roll it over the pointed end of the bisque screw back down onto its groove. Don't do it from the screw head side because you can cut it that way. Clean out the bisque screw hole with carb cleaner, a brush, and compressed air. Then grease and install the bisque screw all the way in. You'll be retuning your idle after this anyway, so you might as well. The twin throttle spring thing. This is all safety equipment, so get it right. You get a tall skinny one and a short fat one. The tall skinny one goes on first and gets hooked around the spring anchor post. The fat spring goes on next and hooks above it. There's a plastic guide sandwiched between the throttle linkage and the springs that helps keep the springs separated from interfering with one another. The skinny spring pokes through a hole in the side of it. And the plastic sandwich separator thing has two holes in it on opposite sides. Notice the center bore of the plastic piece is round so it can rotate freely. And it's the metal throttle linkage that's slotted and has two nubs that help you align the plastic separator thing once it's all assembled. There's also a part protruding from the throttle linkage twin spring ends. Don't worry about which one goes where right now. Wind the assembly between one and three quarter and two times. If you get crossed up and have to reset your grip, back off until you can line up the slotted linkage with the throttle shaft and it'll hold it all together until you've reset your grip. Good luck keeping that sandwich stacked together though. You'd think I'd be smart enough not to hold it in my hands while winding springs. Clearly I'm not. When the throttle stoppers line up on the linkage and the throttle body, push the linkage assembly all the way down onto the throttle shaft. If you marked it, your springs will line back up again, telling you that you got it right. It tells you that the springs will have adequate pressure to close the throttle plate on a running engine. You're not done yet though. Attach the lock washer and the nut. If you got the grips of the twin springs crossed up in the throttle linkage, you'll be able to tell. They won't look right, and they won't be touching. You can grab it with a hooked pick and straighten it back out. Without a throttle switch installed, the throttle plate can stick shut. You'll feel it being sticky, and it's especially bad at the pedal if this isn't set right. 
Install the throttle switch just a hair of a turn past the point where you feel that sticky spot happening and then lock it down. You want the throttle plate to close as far as mechanically possible without rubbing or sticking. You're going to use the base idle set screw or the bisque screw to control your airflow bypass after all, not the throttle plate. I set my throttle plates up as tight as I can get them without touching. We talked about the IIC already, didn't we? Yeah, we did. That's mostly it for the 90 then. I'll show you two more things about it later, but it won't be the fast idle air valve. I drive the Hyundai in every season, so I want the fast idle air valve to work in the winter time. This Hyundai is the only car I can install this thing on, so sorry if you wanted to see that happen. I put a link to an excellent fast idle air valve mod video for a 1990 throttle body in the description. So go watch it if it's what you need. But I put everything back on here the way I found it, and now let's move on to the 91 to 94 throttle body. What is there that I can say differently about the 91 to 94? Not a whole lot, really. All the same techniques work, so I'm going to do what works. Many of the parts are even the same, and we've already covered most of them. Throttle plate screws are the same, ISC motor is metal, but it's got a plastic top, and it doesn't have a wiring harness attached to it. It has the same flange and the same O-ring seal. The throttle position sensor is noticeably different and also isn't hardwired. It's four times the size of the one on the 90, and the screw holes are situated diagonally. It's got a stopper switch. The throttle linkage is the same. The springs are the same. But there's one thing really different with the throttle shaft. The part that engages the throttle position sensor is pressed and bolted onto the shaft. You don't actually have to take the nut off of this side, you just have to take it off the linkage side, but you will not need to separate the TPS linkage from the throttle shaft to service this throttle body. Just like I remember, the throttle plate comes right out with a little bit of a wiggle. That's what it's supposed to be like. The linkage that engages the throttle position sensor is huge, but to most of you looking at this, it's normal. This is what yours looks like. To me, it looks like this thing's never been apart. It still has the mil-spec seals installed, and none of the fasteners have any tool prints on them indicating that anybody's been in here. I popped both of the seals out with a screwdriver. Oops. Hey, don't do that. And gave it the razor blade, wire brush, and a rag treatment. I have to do something different this time, so I'll forego the carb cleaner. Instead, I'm gonna tear this one all the way down and take a different approach. Unlike the 90 throttle body, the 91 to 94 has a removable fast idle air valve. It's held on by five stubborn round pan Phillips head screws that you have to use an impact driver on. Heat would help, but I'm just using penetrating oil and an impact driver to do this. Underneath the fast idle air valve, you'll find this convoluted O-ring. If you have a boost leak coming from between these parts on the throttle body, this is why. This is your boost seal. I've almost got every removable part off of this thing now. Nothing else left except for the bisque screw, and that'll turn this thing into a bare hull. I'm curious to see what will happen if I soak all of these parts in used mineral spirits for a week. I mean, I think I know how it's going to turn out already, but a week goes by so fast here that I know that you're a little curious too. Overnight would be more than enough time, right? But what happens if you forget about it? To be respectful of your time, I'm going to super warp speed through my cleanup of the 1991 throttle body. Soaking in used mineral spirits that might have been contaminated with hydraulic oil just made the dang thing dirtier. It turned it brown. I tell you what, I'll do a manual cleanup of it and then a short bath in some clean mineral spirits and then you'll see what happens. But yeah, that cleanup involved almost every kind of brass wire brush I have and that's a lot of brushes. I even used my Dremel to get the crust out of the crannies because I know which car I might eventually use this on. And I love all four of them, so if there were ever a time that you ever wanted to do some insane thing like polish it or coat it with something, now would be that time. I'm just going for clean here. Since I'll be left with a shiny brushed finish, everything that's aluminum bolted onto this thing will need the same treatment or else it's going to clash. So I repeated this on every metal part. I cleaned flanges with razor blades, and I gave them the same bath everywhere I could. I even made the ISC motor match the same treatment. Cleaned up the bisque screw, wire brushed the throttle stopper switch, which has a neat effect. I wiped down the plastic stuff until it was clean, and I gave the throttle plate an intense buffing with solvents and a rag. Even the ground bracket and the bolt heads got cleaned up. This is going to be one clean throttle body. When I was happy with everything, I laid all my parts out to prepare for assembly, and then got right to work. Let's take a closer look at the seals that you can still get. 
People have gotten away from supplying mil-spec seals for the most part. This seal has a metal insert, but it's completely coated in rubber, so it's very stiff. I don't know if it'll come through in the video after export, but there are ribs on this thing to help it stay put. You can see when it's measured that they make it a little bit bigger than the 14 millimeter hole. On a new healthy seal, the inner lip of the seal measures almost a millimeter smaller than the throttle shaft. That little squeeze is what does all the work to hold your boost in. And that's why the crusty old hardened seals leak. On the threaded side of the shaft, there's a step where it's been turned down to nine millimeters so that they could cut M8 by 125 threads on it. Now for the test fit. You can see how the factory peening process distorts the throttle shaft around the screw holes. If the throttle shaft hangs up on its way in, then something's protruding from it that could potentially cut the lip of your new seals. Best case scenario is that once you've got the throttle shaft all cleaned up, you can just drop it into the bore. There, that's perfect. I guess that means it's ready for some seals now. The routine continues. Thoroughly inspect the edges and the cleanliness of the seal bosses. Check it with your eyes and your fingertips. Nothing you can see or feel with your finger? Okay then, it's ready for a seal. Place the seal dead center on the hole. Press from opposite sides until it starts to move a little bit and then look all around it and inspect it from different angles to make sure that it's straight. If you have a high spot, press lightly on it and massage it until it's even with the rest of the seal. Then press from opposite sides again and repeat. Once you've got it all the way in there, work your way around it once or twice and make sure that it's fully seated. It's the same thing on the other side. Just be sure that if anything hangs or snags, you need to figure out why and start over. Was it you or was it the part? Fix the problem and start over. After the seal's installed, grease the bore. Install the shaft exactly the opposite way as on the 90 model. Put the threaded end through the throttle position sensor side. Turn the shaft as it encounters each seal until you've got the screw holes centered inside the bore. Turn the shaft vertically and install your throttle plate. Check the alignment of the throttle plate and the screw holes to be sure everything's centered. Then set it on something solid to begin installing the throttle plate screws. I'm using red thread locker again. A little dab will do ya. The secret to reusing the factory screws revolves around using as much downforce as possible while installing them. The previously peened screws are going to be hard to turn. You may have spread out the face of the screws a little bit while removing them too. Hey, things happen. If that happens and you distort the screw head, you can tap the head of the screw to flatten it out and reshape some of the damage into something more useful by hitting it with a ball peen hammer. The screws are fairly soft, and if you're not mashing hard while turning, it's easy to slip and strip out the face of the screw, so really lean into it. Also be sure to hold the throttle plate all the way closed while tightening it, or else the throttle plate could move and possibly line up off-center. After both screws are installed tightly, open and check the throttle plate to make sure it's properly aligned. You don't want to find out later once the thread locker is fully set. If everything's good, move on to the throttle linkage. I've got it all clamped up again. Start with a skinny tall spring. Note the angle of the top spring hook where it is right now. Next, the short fat spring, and then the plastic separator. You can try to align the nubs on the throttle linkage with a plastic separator, but it's always going to fight you. Don't worry if it's not lined up. You can fix that before you tighten the nut down when you're done. Wind this one one and three quarters of the way around and slide the throttle linkage shaft into the groove. Put the lock washer and the nut on, but don't honk it all the way down yet. Get a good angle and check to make sure that the nubs on the separator and the linkage are lined up first. Over tightening the nut before doing this check can actually break these parts. Twist it around and fully seat it. Then tighten the nut. You saw the TPS shaft nut pop free when we were taking it apart. Remember on this side that it's the lock washer that keeps it all together, not the torque. Don't over tighten this nut if you remove it. It can pull the throttle plate out of center, causing it to scuff the throttle body bore and hang it open. So once you're done on each side, check the feel of the throttle plate and make sure you're not adding a problem to your freshly rebuilt throttle body. Next, install your idle switch. It didn't take me long to figure out that my cleaning wasn't adequate because I couldn't get the lock nut to turn. Pardon me a moment. There. Install your idle switch. If you want to check to see if it works, Set up your meter and test resistance on any scale, and test for continuity across the electrical connector to the metal body of the switch. It's a momentary ground switch, so if it works, the switch should have continuity when the throttle plate is closed and when it's installed properly. If it doesn't, then it's bad. Replace it. Or if you have ECM link, just check the box to simulate it based off of your TPS signal. 
Speaking of TPS signals, time to install the TPS sensor. The holes are oblong, so you can install it in a variety of positions. Best bet is to line it up based off of where the screws used to sit. The factory paint marks these bolts, so that's usually easy, but the marks seem to vary considerably based on the mood of the employee on the assembly line on that particular day. If you mark them better before disassembling it, then good on you. So now let's talk about this fast idle air valve. The fast idle air valve is a thing in every DSM throttle body. When it's cold, the valve is open to make your car idle higher and to make it less likely to stall until it's up to a stable running temperature. It relies on coolant temperature to close an air bypass valve. You can see the idle speed controller motor is also part of this assembly as well. I suppose they can go bad, mine never have, but when they do, some people just disable them. There's another group of people who do this because hot coolant heats up the throttle bodies and can raise intake temperatures. Not cool on a race car. There's a few different ways to disable the fast idle air valve, and one of them is to use a block off plate. Some block off plates disable the idle speed controller motor, and some don't. This is the one that doesn't. This block off plate gets sandwiched between the throttle body and the idle air assembly. There's also a free way to do this that I'm not covering in this video. That information is everywhere already, but if your fast idle air valve works and is not leaking on your street driven car, why would you want to? The free mod is difficult to undo, but you can always just remove the block off plate. You have to use a new OEM FIAV gasket on the throttle body side of it and an extremely thin coat of RTV to the flange on the fast idle air valve side of it. All 1991 to 1999 cars use the same block off plate and gasket. They cost about 35 bucks combined. 1990 cars require a different procedure that's completely free and I've linked a great concise and to the point video of it being done in the description. Subscribe to that guy too while you're at it. Thank you DSM community. You don't have to do this here, but I use dielectric grease on rubber seals to relieve strain on them while they're being compressed, just to help them find the path of least resistance as they're being squished. I'm also not going to use this block off plate. I told you when this thing started that I was more interested in making these throttle bodies work properly than I was with installing and removing them. A blocked off fast idle air valve and or no idle speed control motor is not going to make your street car run properly. In addition, I would also have needed longer bolts, probably cap screws, to install it because of the thickness of the plate. I put all of it back together the way it's supposed to be. With the fast idle air valve now attached, I just need to put the idle speed controller motor back on with a new gasket, and that's two down. We've made it all the way up to 1994 now. For the 1995 and up throttle body, all the service parts are exactly the same as the 91 to 94, except the gaskets that sandwich it onto your intake. Everything works the same, but the throttle plate is physically smaller, and it has a different throttle position sensor because the idle switch is integrated into it. It also has three parallel vacuum ports on top. The cleaning process is exactly the same. The throttle position mount is exactly the same. The linkage under it is exactly the same. The throttle stopper screw is completely different and non-electronic. It's just a screw and a lock nut. Removing the throttle plate screws works exactly the same. You can see not only is the throttle plate smaller, it's also considerably thinner. It's almost half the thickness of the others. It doesn't have a flat side, but it's still not round. It's sort of an oval shape measuring 54 millimeters across its long edge. The throttle linkage, spring separator, and springs are the same. The throttle shaft is different. The seals are exactly the same, and I remove them the same way. The rubber turns to plastic just the same as it does in the older throttle bodies. None of them are immune to this. If you have strange idle anomalies, boost leaks, or part throttle drivability issues, it can very easily be caused by a leaky throttle body. Now you know what to do to address it. Make sure to check with the throttle plate both open and closed because it may seal in one position and leak like a sieve in another. I'm doing all the cleanup and prep the same, except that I'm using clean mineral spirits to loosen up the funk this time. At this stage, it looks a whole lot like repetition, and most of it is. But I'm going to slow down for what's different. Like this bis screw. Notice something wrong here? No, not just that there's some RTV on it. The magnet isn't sticking to it. No, nope, nope, no. What kind of crap is this? This takes all the fun out of doing this on the car, because you're likely going to destroy this thing trying to dig it out with a pick. While your intake's attached, you could back the screw all the way out, attach your boost leak tester, and then blow it out with compressed air. But the easy means of magnets on the metal screws won't work with this one. 
I poked it out with a wire brush from the other side so you can get a better look at this. Some kind of brown plastic. I'm guessing it probably started out ivory white, but that the car it's from was a smoker. You don't want to use carb cleaner on that because carb cleaner is full of acetone and it'll etch and dissolve plastic. These are really fine threads on this thing. Don't do that. Use something else like mineral spirits to clean up plastic pieces. It's completely safe. Man, that bore's a mess. I used carb cleaner wherever I was supposed to. It works way better than mineral spirits on all of these parts. If you find a gray substance stuck to the inside of the throttle body bore that doesn't wipe off with a rag and carb cleaner, do not make any further attempts to remove it. I'm pretty sure that all of the 2Gs have this treatment done to them. It's applied to help the narrow oval sides of the throttle plate seal against the bore of the throttle body. It's ugly, but don't polish it off. Leave it alone, it belongs there. Now that everything's cleaned up, I want to share something I noticed with the bisque screw O-rings. On the 1991 to 1994 throttle body, I was about to install the factory O-ring when I realized that I have several dozen of these things in various O-ring packages that would fit it, at least with seven hundredths of a millimeter tolerance, which is nothing. So I put that nice factory O-ring right back in its package. I'll save that one for my GSX, I guess. The O-ring size you need is 6 mm inner diameter by 10 mm outer diameter by 2 mm wide. I thought you might like to know this. This Pep Boys metric O-ring collection was like 7 bucks. Bis screws leak, and if the O-ring is really bad, the bis screw can even back out and fall out. If that happens, your car will stay in idle surge and you have to buy a new bis screw to fix it, because you'll never find it anywhere. For crying out loud, try not to get one of these dang plastic ones. They're hard to service, and before you rebuild your throttle body, be sure to check my description for all the rest of your parts. All that info is in there. I'm installing these seals by hand, dry, exactly like I showed you on the 91 to 94 throttle body. They're the same seals, it's supposed to be the same hole. But the linkage side was really easy to get in, and you'll find that this TPS side is tighter than all of the other throttle bodies if you rebuild all of them. You'll fight with this one for a bit. I had to start over three different times before it cooperated, and it was me every time, but there's a noticeable difference on both sides of this one, unlike the 91 to 94. The big difference shows up when you try to install the throttle shaft. You install the 2G shaft from the TPS side, just like with the 91 to 94, but the throttle shaft is cut differently, and the loose seal on the linkage side just pushes right out no matter how carefully you turn the shaft and try to work it through. The 9mm step on the shaft, along with the grease, just pushes this thing right out. Normally this isn't a problem because the plastic spring separator is bolted up flush with it, preventing it from getting blown out by boost, but when you're putting this thing back together it can be a real pain. I just grabbed a deep well 10mm socket, and after a quick clean up to wipe out all the excess grease, I did it again, only this time I used the socket to press into the outside of the seal while mashing and turning on the throttle shaft. Hold on to the bore with your socket hand because you can still push the seal out if you don't. It helps it all stay put. There, now a throttle plate and everything else that's supposed to go into it. This is that moment where all the OCD people rejoice. The screw heads lined up perfectly. How do you like them apples? It's good to put the throttle plate in as soon as you can because it keeps the throttle shaft from slipping back out from the lip of the seal. The TPS harness plug needs to face towards the back of the throttle body and to install it you would need to preload it a bit. So put the TPS on and turn it 90 degrees into position before you install the bolts. If you do the TPS sensor last, it's a little bit easier to fit the throttle body in a bench vise to install the throttle linkage springs, but I've got all kinds of clamps that make it easy to do it either way. Again, assemble a spring sandwich the same way as on the others and give it one and three quarter to two turns before feeding it into the slot and honking it down. Check the spacer position and install the lock washer and the nut hand tight. I set up the 1G throttle plates by feel, but on the 2G throttle bodies the throttle stopper works a little bit differently. I like to double check my starting point by holding the throttle body up to the light and looking for light leakage. Light leakage is also air leakage. I want my bypass system and my ECU's idle routines to do all the work when my throttle plate is fully closed. I don't want extra air leaking past the throttle plate no matter what the factory says about what they call the fixed SAS. So I'm loosening the throttle stopper bolt, which is the thing they call the fixed SAS, and readjusting the throttle plate so that it closes a little bit further and blocks out more of that light. There, you see? You see that? That's a whole lot less light leakage and therefore less air leakage. The factory sets this one and a quarter turn open from fully stuck closed. 
I like it a little bit tighter than that. Same as before, make sure the throttle plate doesn't stick or drag where you set the throttle stopper, and then lock it back down. I will set my bypass idle air mass with the BIS screw later to get my ISC to operate in range. My ISC motor will do all the rest to keep my idle straight, and I will not be compensating for a leaky throttle plate. This helps improve throttle response. It feels great. My adjustment actually helped line the throttle plate back up again with the sealant paint lines that they used in the bore when they first made it. And with all the new seals and gaskets, this thing's going to hold all of its boost in now. That pretty much wraps up the rebuild portion of all three throttle body models used on the Turbo DSM lineup. There are some physical and electrical differences between these three throttle bodies that you need to be aware of if you're building your own 4G63 powered thing that uses one of them. Here I've got the rebuilt 2G throttle body in my hand. You'll notice that it's 46.8 millimeters thick. Here's the 1G 91 to 94 turbo throttle body. You'll notice that it's 46.9 millimeters thick. Not even a whole tenth of a millimeter difference between this one and the 2G. But then we get to the 90 throttle body. This one's 55 millimeters thick. It's almost a full centimeter longer than the others. If you have a 2G throttle body and you want an upgrade, the best option for you is really the 91 to 94. Forget about using the 90. It's a wiring and a plumbing nightmare for you. It has parts that are hard to source should you ever need to rebuild it, and the TPS sensors cost six times what you can get the 91 to 99 sensors for, even from online parts stores. And that's only if you can find them. You can still get that extra 6 millimeters of factory throttle body out of the deal, though, if you use the 91 to 94. The 91 throttle body fits your intake manifold flange bolts. The cheaper sensors are interchangeable. The ISC is the same. The wiring is the same. The only drawback being the routing for your water lines is mildly inconvenienced. The coolant nipples are similarly oriented, but the hoses won't be a perfect fit anymore. They're not far off, so if you've got a second generation car and you want a factory upgrade that you can service, easily install, and still allow your turbo car to behave normally on the street, the 91 to 94 first generation turbo throttle body is your best bet. Of course, the hole in your intake manifold isn't going to be big enough for it, but you can fix that. Swapping out throttle bodies on a 90 model engine is where all the problems arise. It comes with a mixed bag of problems and benefits, and none of them are performance related because it's the same exact size hole. The problems only start when the studs in your intake manifold will need to be removed and replaced, and the TPS sensor doesn't fit behind the fuel rail. It needs different studs and bolts, a different fuel rail, different throttle body ground bracket, different gaskets, different coolant hoses because they won't fit at all, not even close, different electrical connectors on the factory harness for the throttle position sensor, ISC motor, and the idle switch. And after you've done all that, congratulations on your zero horsepower. Of course, if you're starting an engine build from scratch and you have to use this combination of parts, these are the kinds of things that you need to plan for and overcome along the way. The only thing I didn't cover is the electrical testing of the sensors, and I'm going to get an old friend out of the mothballs for this because it sort of illustrates my point. Remember this thing? This is the intake manifold from my GSX. It has a 1G throttle body on it with a 2G throttle position sensor swapped out. I painstakingly dialed this thing in to register .63 volts manually in a previous video. I'm going to show you what the resistance measures on the 20,000 ohm scale, but don't be too concerned with this number. There's a lot of factors that play into this. There are no specifics for this value in the service manual, only an acceptable range of resistance. None of those values that are listed match what your car is looking for for its idle value, so this is what worked for resistance on my GSX to achieve 0.63 volts at idle. The only resistance related tests in any of the service manuals for the TPS sensor refer to checking for continuity between the power and ground pins and the signal in the ground pins. So pins 1 and 4 and pins 2 and 4. For the resistance check, they only want you to ensure that it transitions from low to high resistance smoothly on both pairs of pins across its entire sweep of operation. That's it. It says nothing about what resistance value to set it for. You do all that while it's on the car, or like I said earlier, if you have ECM link, you do it with an offset value. It'll even do it for you. The procedure for the 2G is based solely off of the throttle stopper switch. You use a 0.45 millimeter feeler gauge on the throttle stopper bolt or the SAS, which I can do, but I've got the wrong TPS sensor here. This is a 1G and it doesn't have an idle switch built into it. 
But anyway, you test for continuity across pins three and four if you have them, turn the TPS counterclockwise, and then slowly back until the point where you lose continuity on your meter. Snug down the bolts. Basically, you set up the idle switch position by using a feeler gauge, and the ECU has to just deal with the rest. If you have a test harness to jump the throttle position sensor leads from the connector, you can see if you can hit four to a thousand millivolts off the signal wire when it's powered. But your best resource is an OBD scan tool or engine management system that reads TPS voltage and shoot for 0.63 volts at idle. For the idle speed control motor, there are four circuits to test. Whether you've got a 90 or a 91 to 99, there are six pins on the electrical connector, arranged in two rows of three. The center pins are common pins on each row. So you test from the center pin to each outside pin in all four possible combinations, and hopefully you achieve a value of 0.28 to 0.32 ohms. I found they still work fine up to 44. If you have continuity and even resistance on all four circuits, then you're good. You can also put the sensor in your hand and apply six volts across the same pins and feel the sensor react to the current if you suspect that it's jammed. That's about it. I can't think of anything else to share with you. This rebuild procedure is not in the service manual. Whether or not you've got a garage queen, a track queen, or a street queen with idle or throttle response issues, hopefully this video sheds some light on how to get your throttle body in the best health that it can be. Don't forget to check out the description for part numbers and more information on this job. And be sure to stop by and check out the other channels that helped improve this production. Their links are in there too. The most specialist thanks of all, of course, go to my Patreon followers, who help me keep the lights on and my cameras rolling to bring more DSM-focused content to everybody's subscription feeds. Not subscribed? Simple. That button's down there too. Please share the love for your brothers and horsepower, and until next time, stay tubed. Hmm. Hmm. What? No ground.